Our focus this term is on imperialism and how it changes the world between 1800 and 1914. And the first thing that we need to get a handle on is the definition of imperialism itself. So what are we talking about when we say imperialism? Imperialism is when one country dominates another country's government, or it's when one country dominates another country's economy, or when one country dominates another country's cultural life, okay? Or any combination of these three things, all right? When one country dominates another country's political, economic, or cultural life, that's said to be imperialism. Now, we tend to focus on our personal experience with imperialism, which would be back when Europe established America as a colony in the 1500s. And, you know, we tend to, to think of that relationship, that colonial relationship, as being sort of the definitive example of imperialism. But this imperialism that we're going to talk about in the 1800s is different from that, okay? Yes, Europe had colonies in America, as you know, India, Southwest Asia. They also had small establishments in Africa and China. But the difference is, overall, Europe didn't have a tremendous amount of influence on the cultures and people who were living in India or Africa or China at that time. So yes, uh, in the Americas, Europe had a lot of influence, not so much in the rest of the world. This changes as a result of the Industrial Revolution and Western nations becoming very powerful. This power and this Industrial Revolution also brought with it new motives. Primarily, the motives were economic. They needed natural resources. They needed people to sell to. There were also military motives, how to protect your, your ships as they're trading all over the world, but also sometimes claiming a colony near a rival European country's colony just in the interest of national security. There's also humanitarian or religious motivations. The Europeans were very proud of their post-industrial revolution culture and they wanted to spread the blessings of modernization on the rest of the world. And then let's not forget that social Darwinism is a widely held ideology where the notion of one country dominating over another's and kind of uh, you know forcing their culture on another's would really result in an improvement in the whole human race. Because of these motives, most of the world comes under European control between 1870 and 1914. Now at the time, there were some critics to imperialism, people who pointed out that it was immoral, that it was hypocritical, that it was merely a tool of the rich, but by and large, the vast majority of people in Europe felt that imperialism was a good thing. I also would like you to be aware that there are three main forms of imperialism. The first one is the one that we're familiar with because America used to be a colony and that's when there's total control. European leaders come in, they impose culture, they set up a government. It's very time consuming and very expensive. So a little cheaper way of doing it is to set up a protectorate where you leave local rulers in place but the local rulers do whatever the European government tells them to do. You don't have to commit a lot of military uh, and you know it's a little more palatable to the people in these countries that are being imperialized. However, you don't even have to go through all that. You can set up spheres of influence where all the outside power does is claim exclusive trade rights. They don't deal with the government at all. Um, and this was incredibly popular in the, in the end of the 1800s. And then lastly, just to, to show you, my daughter and I were shopping um, a few weeks ago and we came across a brand of pickles that call themselves spheres of influence. So when I say that people really do know this history stuff, this is the kind of thing that, um, that I'm talking about.